Uh, my name is John Little, and this is a workshop that was requested by the DataFest group. Uh, DataFest is a, is a contest about analyzing data that is sponsored by the Duke Sci Department. And my center, Center for Data and Visualization Sciences, is always happy to participate in that. This particular uh, workshop that they requested is about making slides out of R. And there's a great package called Sharingan that we're going to talk about today, which is a way to make slides out of R Markdown. And R Markdown is a way to do literate coding where you have your pros and your code chunks integrated into your analysis. So there's a lot of jargon there, and I want to break it down. Uh, uh, anybody who's been working with R for a while, some of this will feel a little bit um, redundant, but it's it's worth it to double check. However, let me just mention that if you are brand new to um, to R and R Studio, and this is the first time that you've been on one of my workshops, let me just point out the R Fund site, which is a sub branded site for my department, my Center for Data and Visualization Sciences. And what you'll find there is a whole series of modules on different things that you can do in R. And for example, I mentioned that Windows machines sometimes need to be configured with Git. So if you clicked on find out more, there is a link to a previously recorded session and there's always code and uh, slides if they're available. But um, it's the, it's the um, historical information here that's useful. If you're brand new, I recommend this first module, Quick Start with R. Uh, there are a series of shorter videos, 20 minutes or less, sometimes just five minutes that cover important concepts. So quick start, deplier for data, um, data wrangling. There's a whole series of different little sub videos here. So RStudio projects, which I just mentioned, would be right there. RStudio, the IDE, tidyverse, joining and merging, pivoting, all of those things. If I cover something too fast, just know that you can, you can refer to those videos later. But going back to that GitHub link, um, what we're going to cover is we're going to cover Markdown, what it is and why it's useful. Then we're going to start by producing a, our very first sharing in slides. And finally, I want to point out that there are some, there's a slide deck on just documentation. Because what I've found is that sharing in is actually pretty easy to get started with. Uh, but slides often, they take on sort of the, a kind of a heightened, um, importance for the person who's authoring them, because usually we look at slides very closely in terms of the style and the presentation. And uh, so you probably want to go beyond the default style and presentation of sharing. And, and what I found is the documentation is kind of all over the place. So I tried to pull together the important parts into this one document. Now, let me just briefly explain a little bit about GitHub, which is the site that this repository is hosted on. There are really just three files here. There's the 00 markdown.rmd, that stands for R markdown. There's the 01 get started sharingin.rmd. And there's the 99 documentation links.rmd. Okay, and so the, the cool thing about R markdown is that you can, you can put your code and your prose into an R markdown document. And then up at the very top, and we'll look at this in just a minute, there's a line that can identify what kind of report you want to produce. Um, so do you want to produce slides or do you want to produce a dashboard or a PDF document or whatever? So I used um, R Markdown in the first case, in this first document, to render a .mb.html document. That's a notebook document that you could send to anybody like you would send a PDF document. But the difference being that because in this case it's an HTML document, it actually has the ability to be interactive, um, unlike a PDF document. I don't want to really uh, go on too long about these different report styles, but the code is the .rmd. So that has a rendered output. This .rmd has a rendered output. And then in while you can use R Markdown to generate PDF documents, for the case of slides, it's often easiest if you just open the slide deck, which is, uh, it's rendered into an HTML document. So open the slide deck in either Firefox or Chrome, and then just print it. And rather than printing it to your printer, print it to a PDF file. 
The advantage there is that this HTML file is not self-contained. This one is, but this one is not. So you need some extra, we can talk about that, but you need some extra supporting files that are easy to pull together. I just didn't do it. The easier step is to print it out as a PDF document. So in this case, if I'm hosting it on GitHub, as I am, I can just click on the PDF document and you'll see that the slides will be rendered um, here and a person could scroll through them. Okay, so clicking back, um, there is the same thing for the documentation. Right? There's an HTML slide deck and there's a PDF rendered version. Both, uh, in this case, they did not both get pr produced. I'll just hammer that home. They did not both get produced from the RMD. Although typically the RMD is how you produce all of your derivatives. It's just slides are special. All right, so we're gonna start with um, 00R Markdown. So uh, one more time, if you haven't done this, click on the green button, click on the download zip, unzip that, and then open the R Studio project. That will take you or should take you to uh, an R Studio project that looks a little bit like this. I'm just to make sure that I've got everything clean. I'm gonna click restart. And of course, I'm going to open this 00R mark, 00 markdown. Probably worth pointing out um, at this point that markdown is a general concept. It was developed by these two guys, uh, John Gruber and Aaron Schwartz, back in 2004. Although it's called markdown, it actually is a markup language. So for anybody who's looked at the source of a web page, the source that makes a web page work generally minimally is something called HTML, hypertext markup language. And these are all ways to provide structure to a document. Um, in the case of Markdown, markup languages are often hard to read. You often need something like a browser to render that into something easier to read. The, the goal of Markdown was to make a markup language that is appealing to human readers. So this is a, a, an example of that. What it means by appealing to human readers is that you can read this markup and basically get a sense of what's happening here, right? Uh, you don't have to have a special viewer just to read the content. You may need a special viewer to get the style that I wanna impose, but not to just read the content. So that's what Markdown is. Now, the guy who developed the Sharingan package that we're gonna to use today, his name is Yui. Z, I believe is his last name. Um, he actually created R Markdown. There's no single definitive version of Markdown. And there's minor, minor differences between Markdown and R Markdown. Uh, for the most part, they work almost exactly the same, but we are in fact using R Markdown because we're in, in this case in R Studio. Okay, so Markdown basically consists of kind of like three parts. There's a little header at the top. And importantly, it has a line like this. All the, this header can get more elaborate, but it always has, uh, well, there's actually one footnote to that, but we don't have to go into that. There's, it always has um, one output variable to identify what is the rendered output that you want. So in this case, it says HTML notebook, which is a good way to start. If you haven't done this before, anytime you want to start in Markdown, the easiest way to start is to go to new file, our notebook. And that produces another markdown document that, that displays really what I want you to know. Right? A markdown document has a header, and then it has prose and code chunks. And the code chunks are the analysis. The prose is going to explain the analysis. Uh, you can have multiple code chunks. In this case, it turns out that the prose is explaining our markdown. So it's a little self-referential. But it's useful to know every time you open up one of these notebooks, you're going to get information about how Markdown works. So here's an example of a code chunk and some very basic R code. If I wanted to execute that, I could click on the green button that actually is identified right there. If I wanted another code chunk, as it says right here, I could just put my cursor right there and say, in my case, I'm on Windows, Control Alt I and I get another code chunk, or um, I could put in another one, I could use the mouse. 
have one more code chunk. I can put more elaborate code in each one of these things, but I'm not going to do that. Um, just put some comments in there. And then typically what someone will do, uh, you'll notice that there is some other markdown going on here. There's a link. There's That's a bolded word. Uh, if I wanted this word to be italics, I could wrap it in underscores. And then when I click preview, it's going to ask me for a file name. So I'm just going to say, um, hello world. It's important to have a .rmd extension. And uh, R should render that. So it, it, it just rendered it into the .md.html extension. And you can see that down in the viewer. And you can see that the title is rendered as a header one. And you can see a link. And you can see, oops, I was wrong about that. I said that that run was bold. It's in fact, asterisks or underscores, single ones make things italic, whereas doubles make it bold. I'm going to just click preview again so you can see the difference. There's bold, there's italics. And then you can, um, of course, integrate your code. If I didn't want my code to show up, maybe I have a technical audience. Maybe my goal is to have a technical audience and I want them to see the code. Or maybe my goal is an executive audience where I don't want them to see the code. I just want them to see the output. There's all kinds of um, configuration options that you can get to in a code chunk by clicking on this gear right here. So in this case, I would change it to show output only. And uh, I could run the whole document. There's only one code chunk that matters. But um, preview it one more time, and you'll see that that code chunk disappeared. The other two code chunks are still there. They each have just one comment in them. Uh, I could turn those apart off. I could do it globally, et cetera. That's what our markdown essentially lets you do. It's an example of what's called literate coding, right? It's this idea that all of what you need to produce your output is in a single file, and your prose is intermingled with your code and your analysis. And that goes towards reproducibility. If you keep it all in one spot and come back to it after setting it down for six months, you don't have to wonder, oh, how am I going to copy and paste this? What program did I use for this part of the analysis? And what program did I use for the visualization? And how did I exactly produce the output? And then I copied it somewhere and then I pasted it into Microsoft Word. Right? All of those copy and paste steps end up being essentially barriers to reproducibility. So that's another reason why people use R Markdown and literate coding. Right? Another example of literate coding, aside from R Markdown, you may have heard of Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, Jupyter actually stands for uh, three coding languages, Julia, um, Python, and R. So technically, you could be multilingual in a Jupyter Notebook. You can be multilingual in R Markdown as well. Uh, so there's some repeat there. I'm going back to my 00, zero R Markdown. Um, covered that part, and I covered that part, right? Getting started, you just have to click on our notebook. Now, oh, this is important to point out. In case you don't have the latest version or one of the later versions of our studio, if you upgrade, there's a nice feature in 1.4 and above, which allows you to have, rather than what feels like this old 1970s style of word processing, <clears throat> uh, I guess I should probably say 1980s style because almost none of us were word processing in the 70s, including me. Um, but if you wanted a visual editor from our studio version 1.4, there's a new icon over here and there's an option from the menu that says switch to visual editor. So I could press that button and indeed um, I could then, you know, do the editing like we're all used to in a super modern context. Um, and it works quite well. If I wanted to turn that word into a link, right? I could um, add a link, duck, go.com, and then it's a link. Um, now, that's very nice. I myself find that I kind of prefer the other way once I've gotten very used to it. Uh, so, no recommendation there. If you prefer the visual editing, upgrade and and it will work very well. It'll work the way you expect it to, except, and this is maybe unfortunate, but important to, to know that under the current 
um, version of Sharingan, which is the package we're going to use today for slides, visual editing doesn't work. Um, and that's probably because uh, you can do some very specific things with Markdown and the visual editor is relatively new and the Markdown package is a little bit older. Maybe those th two things will merge. But if you wanted to undo the visual editing to turn that off and back go back to the traditional editing, you could just click that icon again. Okay, so it's good to know about that. Uh, we talked about this, right? Um, up in the very top, line three, this is gonna produce an HTML notebook when I click preview. For most of the other markdown options, this will change from a preview button to a knit button. So you'll hear people talk about, instead of saying rendering, they'll say I knitted the document. Um, here's an example of some of the kinds of documents that you can knit, right? Um, HTML notebooks we just saw. HTML documents, they're roughly the same, but the sort of the difference is that HTML notebook is kind of for development, whereas an HTML document is really kind of more towards the final production. And the reason why is that an HTML document will, every time you knit it, it will spawn a protected unique R process and start from line one and go all the way to the bottom. Whereas as opposed to HTML notebooks that are more for development, you can run codes out of sequence, you can run code chunks out of sequence, um, you can skip things, and you don't have to run the whole document in order to render it. So I myself tend to mostly work in R Markdown notebooks until I've decided that I want to make something else, be it a Word file or a PDF or a dashboard slides that we're going to do today. Um, so a useful exercise that we might try before the end of the day is that you could take this 00, zero underscore R Markdown document and turn this into a series of slides. As we get towards the end, you'll be able to do that. It will require a little more editing in the case of each slide, just like it would if you wrote your outline in Microsoft Word and then decided to turn that Word document into a Microsoft PowerPoint. You know, because of the nature of slides where precision and placement kind of really matters, you're gonna to have to do a little bit of tweaking. But you can do it, you can definitely do it. And so you can imagine that if you have code chunks interspersed in your document, uh, you're gonna be able to keep everything together. So we talked about the YAML header that's up at the top. Uh, we talked about rendering reports. And uh, just a minute, just a quick comment about help. If you've never worked with R Markdown before, from the help menu, you can go to Markdown Quick Reference. And this is a really nice handy guide of the ways that you can mark up your text. I'm not going to cover the details right here. It's very short. It's barely a page long. If that's not enough for you, remember that the, the Hello World document that I created actually has a link to the R Markdown website. In addition to those two sources, if you rather than scroll down to this Markdown, if you hover over cheat sheets, there are even two more R Markdown cheat sheets. And so the more you work with Markdown, the more you may find that you're using some of those features like, like footnoting, that it automatically, every footnote you add, it's gonna it's going to um, increment each footnote by one, things of that nature. So they take a little bit of work, but not much. And you'll find that as you use them, they become quite intuitive. Uh, nonetheless, every time you use a command line kind of tool, if you don't remember it, it's handy to know where those um, reference guides are. OK, so what I want to do next is I want to start by making an R, a sharing in slide deck. But before I do that, I think what I wanna do is I wanna show you, here's a slide deck that I'm actually gonna be, this is a sharing in slide deck. I'm gonna actually be just, uh, using this tomorrow morning for a different presentation I'm doing. Uh, but the reason why I wanna show it to you is because I've been working with sharing in for a couple of years. And as I mentioned earlier, to do the easy stuff is, is really quite simple and very intuitive, but it's taken me a little while to, to find the exact format of how I want to present a slide deck, right? What are the fonts that I want to use, things of that nature. And this has evolved into this slide deck where you can have a whole image on the right and then have it um, shift to the left for the next slide and things like that. Um, some of this takes a little bit of doing. 
And I, so I want to show you this may be the, maybe even if you don't like the fonts I'm using, you might recognize that you'll end up developing your own slide style. And Sharingan certainly supports that. But we're not going to get too far into that today. I'll try and point you to all of those things that all of those techniques are in the 99 documentation links uh, files. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to just go back to files. And if you want to work along with me, that's fine. Uh, you can open up an 01 get started sharingan.rmd file. And I have mine right here. I'm going to scroll all the way up to the top. And you'll notice right off the bat that my um, YAML header is much more elaborate than what I had a moment ago. Now, I want to go through this, but before I do, um, if you have installed Sharingan, uh, let me go back to GitHub for just a second. Down in the README file, the very last line, you could use that to install Sharingan. It would also try to reinstall Tidyverse. It wouldn't, it wouldn't hurt, we harm anything if you already have Tidyverse installed. Um, it won't harm anything if you don't have Tidyverse installed. But this is how you would install Sharingan if you don't already have it. Going back to RStudio, of course, you could always click on Packages, Install, XAR, Sharingan. And there are two packages. We'll talk about Sharingan theme later. Um, but you could install that. Once you get that installed, the easiest way to get started with to get this rather elaborate YAML header is to do it this way. Go to File, New File, scroll down. This time, instead of our notebook, scroll down to our Markdown. When you get to this wizard, choose From Template. I'm going to do this twice because I know it goes a little bit fast. And when you get from to a from template, scroll down until you find the option that says Ninja Presentation. And over on the right, it tells you that's coming from the Sharingan library, right? If I click on that, it's going to open up a very similar version of this document. And the nice thing about this document is it's actually the directions on how to use Sharingan, right? So all you have to do, again, I'll come right back to this to show you this again, but all I have to do to make this work is click knit. And when I click knit, the R markdown is gonna render and there's a slide uh, that I modified of UE's uh, sharing and documentation. It's largely the same. Okay, so just real quickly, I'll show you that one more time so it doesn't get lost. New file, R markdown from template, Ninja presentation. And this time I will click OK so you can see what happens. Just threw up a new file. And all you would have to do is click knit. And you would get very similar documentation. I modified it only ever so slightly. I think I'm going to do this, but I don't know, I don't know that I'm going to recommend that you do this right off the bat. But one of the nice things about sharing them, in other words, don't follow me at this point, but just so you can see everything on one screen is that Sharingan comes with this tool called the Infinite Moon Reader, which you can largely ignore what that means. I'm gonna click restart just to make sure everything stays clean. It puts a thing into my add-ins all the way down at the bottom in my case, and I'm gonna click Infinite Moon Reader. And what Infinite Moon Reader does is it allows me to render my slides in this viewer in real time rather than having to click knit every single time. So that's gonna be useful for our demonstration. You may be perfectly comfortable with and fine with click, clicking knit every time and there's nothing wrong with that. But for this demonstration, it's just gonna be a little bit easier if you can see what I'm doing in real time. And what I mean by in real time is if I decide to change the name from Sharingan demo to Sharingan demonstration and I click save, um, I'll give the, the renderer a minute to to reconfigure and it's updated the slides. And so that as I move my slide deck, um, I can create new slides, right? So this stuff right up here, you can, you can pretty much guess what's gonna happen there. And then what really makes Sharingan work is that those two lines right there, output to Sharingan Moon Reader. And that's how you render these slides. So what we've got here is a markdown bit of code that says header one, right? A single 
hashtag is a header one. If I wanted to make a, a second level hashtag, I could do header two or third level. And you can see over on the right that it's changing size and rendering different ways, depending on how I limit it. I also have some class information up at the top. This is allowing me to center the text um, horizontally, actually vertically, but um, well, I always get those confused, but it doesn't matter. Center has my, has my text centered, whereas middle has my slide centered from top to bottom, right? So if I took out one of those classes and I resaved it, this slide should reconfigure and now you can see it's top justified. So those, that's one thing that Sharingan allows you to do is it allows you to create classes of um, slide behavior. And when we get into the documentation, you'll see how that works. But again, if you had done that new doc down, that new, new R markdown from template shared in presentation, you would get all of this information in the documentation. And so you could see how it works in real time. Uh, so here's my first slide. And then if I go to the second slide, you can see that there's another feature the ability to have background images. And so I can have text on top of this if I want to. But one of the things that's really striking to me about this is that there's this little code chunk right here. This is usually at the very top. I actually moved it down one just so I could start with a text slide. But let me move this slide up to the top so you can see how you, you create new slides by just, just uh, adding three new dashes, like you see at line 25 or line 14 or line 37. So if I wanted a new slide between Nifty and, and this image, I could just use my cursor and create a new slide and make it header size two, new slide. And um, then I could do things like say, uh, Sharon, Sharon in slides, super nifty and I might make that bold and it would be really helpful to have a whole bunch of um, ready-made text but I'm just going to copy this over and over again and then I might do something like say um, I don't know fruit uh, apple grape and orange right and I've made a little bulleted list now, in the spirit of our markdown, I might want to do something more than that, right? Maybe I want to have something on the left-hand side and something on the right-hand side. And this is in these slides, if you go farther down, but I'm just going to show you. There's a class called pull left, pull dash left. And you anything that goes inside of pull dash left is going to be pulled to the left. So I'm going to paste my text in there. And just to make it pretty, I'm going to kind of separate out some of this stuff. And then I might also want to have, let me hit save so it re um, renders. It might make sense to you that there's also a class called pull dash right. And so I'll put pull right over here. And Sometimes you have to kind of finesse it a little bit. Like this seems to be higher than that. I don't really like that. So I'm just going to put in a break, which you can do a number of ways. I think I haven't tried this before, so we'll see if that works. Yeah, that didn't work. So ignore that. Uh, one of the nice things about Markdown is you can actually use HTML markup in the Markdown document. So in HTML markup, there is a a tag called BR for break. And you'll notice that I could have several of those and I could use that to really kind of finesse the exact location of the text. Um, I, my goal here was to have it, have them be roughly in the same spot. And they're close, they're not as close as I want. Uh, I might move that up. No, not up, down. I want, anyway, I could fool with this for a long time and eventually I'll get it right. The point that I wanted to show you is there are these, these classes called pull left and pull right. And 
it maybe is not a surprise, but just so you see it, you can do other things like you can uh, center the text or right, justify the text um, in either one of those cases. And that, that's essentially how you compose slides in sharing. Right now, I said that this thing is usually at the top. So I want to go ahead and move this to the top. And then I'll explain why and a little bit more about what is here. I'm going to put it really right up here, uh, right there. And I'll move back up to the top and re-render the slides. The reason why this is always up at the top is because of this little code chunk here that does not display. And I'll just be honest with you, I don't even know what it does. I never really looked into it. I assume that it's important for how um, web pages get rendered because sharing in slides get rendered as if they were web pages, right? The viewer for sharing in slides is a web browser. Um, but I have from time to time left it out. It didn't hurt anything. Just sort of my policy rather than looking up to see what, exactly what it does was just to leave it in. It seems to be fine. There's some other uh, markdown that you see right here. This is the way to separate out the slide from the speaker notes, right? So these are speaker notes. And the way you would get speaker notes to appear is that there are um, shortcut keys for sharing in slide presentation. So if you have a sharing in slide presentation up in, in Firefox or Chrome or whatever, you can hit your question mark and it'll give you the keystroke tips. But I happen to know that if you hit the letter P, um, it gives you the speaker note view, right? So my current slide, my speaker notes, and my next slide. So I could actually clone this and have um, one slide that's being presented in the speaker notes and all of the, the nice features of speaker notes could happen at the same time. So I'm going to change that back to its presentation view. And let me just double check where we, how we are on time. It's 7.10. We started at 6.30. Um, OK, so I did a little bit of on the spot sort of documentation. But just remember that the stuff that I just showed you is basically embedded throughout this whole document. So here's another sharing in slide that's centered in the middle. It has a header one and a header three. Uh, here is what's called an inverse slide, right? So if you want to have like sections among your slides, you could use the class inverse, and that's going to change everything. If I take that away and re-render the slides, you'll see how it changes back to normal. Um, so I will return that to where it was and re-render that slide. And you can see that I put some text here inside of um, what looks like a code chunk, but it does not, it's not an R code chunk because it doesn't have the code designation. And that just makes it a monospaced um, box that you can use to demonstrate or show some code that you're not planning on running or that you need to appear in monospace. You could do that, and I do that rather frequently. Uh, here's a slide that reminds you how to install sharing. Here's a slide. Oh, there's a nice feature here that's demonstrated here. Notice that we went from three dashes down to two dashes, and there are several two dash options interspaced by single dashes, right? Well, what does all this mean? The single dashes are for bulleted items. And the two dashes are to allow you to incrementally reveal your slides every time you click on it, right? So you can see that there, this is all part of one slide from here up to the three dashes at line 81. And I was just able to incrementally reveal that in my presentation mode, uh, in my case with my arrow keys, but I think you can click on it too. So that's a nice feature. Uh, another nice feature that's worth pointing out, if you can skip the, uh, uh, this is kind of an inside joke uh, or an Easter egg by the developer. Um, this is a friend of his, his name is Carl. Uh, and the point really of this slide, aside from he wanted to 
highlight Carl's face larger than the image usually is, is to show some of the background image features that you can use. And you'll notice that because he set class to inverse, his header size one, which is appearing at the bottom, because it's inverse, it also shows up as font equals white. So that's how you could use the basics of Markdown to the best of your advantage. Now, this is important. Um, he calls this a ninja presentation. And he, he points out that uh, sharing in slides are built on this library called remark.js. And so there's really very little between difference between Sharingan and Remark. They basically work the same, uh, but most there's a lot of documentation at Remark that he does not recreate. The, the main differences are things like Infinite Moon Reader and the ability to run within our studio. So I kind of largely ignore Remark, but it's nice to know, and he recommends right here, that you should probably read the Remark wiki that is the documentation about um, configuring slideshows and slide classes and some of those things, classes like we just mentioned, right? Class center, class bottom. Oops, sorry. Um, all of that is documented at this wiki. And it's sometimes easier to, it's, it's probably worth, it says right here, you should read through it at least once. Probably true. I, I will admit that I didn't read through it at all until I'd been using Sharingan for a year or two. But when I finally got around to reading it, I found it helpful. Just scan it, just to see what are the things that it can do um, that I might want to do with my slide deck. Okay, here's another. This is the same picture as before. You'll just notice that this is the actual picture using the background size cover to cover up the whole slide. And you'll notice that it's it's there's more depth of field to this picture, or there's a wider um, frame because of the one previous. He was using some features to make it zoom in. So that's one way that you can more features that you can use with your art. With your images, here's another inverse slide that, and from this point forward, he's mostly just talking about uh, how you can use sharing. Uh, this particular slide, he's talking about the differences between the two. But here's something in this next slide that many of you will find useful. Um, if you are, particularly if you're going to DataFest or you're coming to this from StatSci, you may need to display. Uh, LaTeX formulas, LaTeX um, formulas that are marked up in LaTeX. The way to do that is to surround your formula, your LaTeX formula in double dollar, excuse me, double dollar signs. And that will display it nicely in the middle of the page. Um, if you were to uh, render your LaTeX formula in single dollar signs, you could render your formula in line with the rest of the text. There are some limitations there that he mentions. Uh, and a lot of what goes on forward, and we're not gonna do this much longer because I wanna get to some of the other stuff that's useful. Um, here's how you can display code. Here's how you can display plots. So you could do a ggplot there if you're familiar with ggplot. Here's how you can display tables. Uh, if you're not used to tables, I like I like the GT package a little bit better. GT tables. Let's see, library, tidyverse, library, GT, uh, iris, slice. Take six lines of the iris, and we will display that with the GT function from the GT library. And let's go ahead and uh, see. Let's see if I can get it to render that. Uh, there you go. So a little too much code up there at the top. 
which happens from time to time. The easiest thing to do is just to change that down to show output only. And I'm just going to put my cursor in here and hit save again. And the moon reader will do. Oops, that didn't display exactly as I wanted because I wanted that to be centered. Center. And uh, that's sort of an example of how you might go about using literate coding with R to render in your slides. Let's see what else is useful. And there's not much more uh, that we really need to talk about, but it's nice to know that you can, if you have HTML widgets, you can have interactive parts of your slide deck. Uh, so Leaflet, not all of the HTML widgets necessarily will work in Sheridan, but a lot of them do. Leaflet is for, for doing maps. Uh, DT tables is for interactive tables. If you need to click on things or just find the things that are pedal length 1.4, uh, you know, that actually is a fully functional interactive HTML widget. And since sharing and slides are actually HTML or rendered as HTML, they work. Uh, there's some stuff here about autoplay and all that. You can read through that if those are important. Just want to see if there's anything else that I really want you to know about. Uh, code highlighting probably is. If you need to highlight some code, you can get these yellow lines based on how you use your markup. Uh, there's another example of you know, two lines that you want to that you want to point out um, in a ggplot. And then he goes on, on and on to display some stuff. So what I thought might be useful at this point, uh, but you are welcome to redirect or ask questions. But I wanted to suggest why don't you all make your first shared and slide deck by going to our markdown and just play around with it for five minutes. And we'll come back and you can, I mean, you can unmic at any point and ask any questions, but we'll make sure that there are no further questions. And then after that, I'll show you how you can use some other packages to manage more of the style of the slides, right? How you can set fonts and colors and things like that. So that's my suggestion. Go ahead and make your first slide deck. But if anybody wants to unmike, go ahead and do so now and ask a question. And just in case you're still looking at my screen, I will remind you that in order to make a slide deck, uh, you could start by going to new file, R markdown from template, ninja presentation. OK. And I'll set my timer for about five minutes. So that produces a pretty basic document. And in my case, it leaves a lot to be desired. I'm not crazy about the fonts. Uh, I don't especially like the lack of color. I don't like the pink. But uh, how to change it? And the answer is that one of the easier ways to change it is to start using a thing called the Sheringen themer. OK, so that is this library right here. And then you remember I said there was some stuff that you wanted to put up in the top of the other document. Some of it is related to Sheringen themer. So if you wanted to install Sheringen themer, of course, it's a package just like anything else. You could just start typing Sheringen, and it's the second one that shows up. And once you do that, you should definitely check the, um, oh, it's in my documentation document, I'm 100% certain. So it will be, it will be a little bit farther down. Um, but once you run Sheridan Themer, you can run uh, this, this is their example, the example style mono accent, where you, in this case, I'm just running the, the false that they suggest, which is to use this green color, I'll show you a little bit more about how you can identify those colors in a minute. But that's a, a hex code for uh, kind of a green. And that's how I'm identifying the base color. And then it's also identifying different fonts, depending on whether or not they're header fonts, text fonts, or code fonts. Or again, I just use the defaults, but I like them all better than, um, than what comes with Sheringen by default. 
And so you put that up at the top. And then the other thing that you have to do, what this one of the things this will produce is a file called sharedgen-themer.css, which is a cascading style sheet. That's what CSS stands for. And uh, so I should have, there it is, it produced that file right there, sharedgen themer CSS. And so then I need to add line nine. And that's all in the documentation for sharing and Thema, which we'll look at in just a second. Uh, but once I, once I have those two things, I can re-render the files. And now it has this green and these new fonts. You'll notice that uh, I have three lines commented out here. You could comment out these two lines from the example and uncomment out these three lines. And there I'm using some specific colors that Duke has blessed as part of the Duke color palette. So let's just see what happens when I click save, see if it re-renders in blue, yeah, it did. So that's where I got the blue and now I've got a blue instead of green. Uh, and then if I can get a secondary color to show up, it'll be in this Prussian blue. We'll talk more about that. But um, so this reminds you where you get your documentation. Let me just point out that there's a link right here in this slide to chapter seven of a book called The Definitive Guide, R Markdown, The Definitive Guide. It's also written by Yui. And chapter seven is all about how to use sharing in slides. So it's worth knowing that that's there. It's probably worth a read if you find that you like this. And there's another bit of documentation. Let me just go ahead and click on that. There's chapter seven, it goes on for a while. There's a whole bunch of stuff that's very useful. There's also the sharing in wiki, which has some really useful things like slide layout, slide number, footer header, how you can deal with stuff like that, slide margins, link color. All of that is very useful. Uh, so if you wanted to do something with slide number, this tells you how you can, uh, I think, I think it tells you how you can mask the slide number. I forget how you can change the format. Uh, here's Remark.js. Remark.js, again, that's the foundation for sharing in slides. So here's a link to the Remark.js wiki that we talked about. And there's some useful things there. Remember, we're talking about class like middle and center. It's more on the different kinds of classes that are available, more on how you can manipulate background images. You can make things like templates and layouts that get carried through to all of the rest of the slides. So if you have a template that you really like, you can generate this and you can turn that template on and off as needed because you might have a slide that should not have the template on it. Talks more about cascading style sheets, which is ultimately the way that you really, um, that you really uh, affect the style of something. So for example, I'm using Markdown right here to make that header size one, Remark.js. But that's just a way, you don't have to remember this, but um, it's just a way to do an HTML header size one, right? So if I, um re-render that slide why did that happen oh because i didn't h1 uh, it looks the same but the nice thing about html is there's a feature where you can affect uh, the style of something so i could say color colon well, let's just make it easy red um so all of those style features, that's what um, sharing and theme are supposed it makes easy on you. But if you really want to start tweaking individual slides, you're going to end up editing style sheets, style sheets like we identified right here. Right. So I'm just going to show you real quickly. You probably don't want to get into this right off the bat. I just want you to be aware that it's possible. So if I open up this style sheet, um, this is what a really elaborate style sheet looks like. You can create a custom style sheet that feeds off of the elaborate one and overrides some things. And that's how people uh, start 
to really customize their slides. Um, but this is not a class on style sheets. So I just want to point to, point to you the fact that there's information about how style sheets work. And if you really want to, if you really get into this and you're struggling with style sheets, by all means, reach out to me because I've done a fair amount of work on this. And I can usually uh, point you in the right direction. But prior to style sheets, this is why you might want to use something like Sheridan and Thema, right? Because you can quickly define some primary colors and some fonts and some styles. And as I mentioned to you, I uh, created the code to use blue, some dupe colors. I got those dupe colors from this link right here, where it says dupe colors, which is a web page that is basically a style guide for Duke University. So there's the main hex color code for Duke blue, what we call Duke blue. Apparently Duke has a royal blue. That would be the hex code for that. Um, here's the Prussian blue that I had used in mine. You know, if you want to use dandelion or cast iron or Shackelford, all of those hex codes are right there. You don't have to use those. You can do anything you want. But if you wanted to make it look very Duke-like, that's how you would do that. And then what's really cool about sharing and themer is not only does it theme your slides, with some colors that you choose, but it has a feature um, that will theme your, your GG plot with the colors that you choose. Now, in this case, I pulled this image off of the internet. So it did, if I had generated this, this GG plot image within a code chunk, it would then have proceeded to use the Duke blue colors that I chose just a moment ago. But as you can see, it's the shades of green that were used in the default green that I started with. But that's, I think, a really nice feature. It's a nice touch stylistically. Um, and then this coming to the end, um, I showed you right off the bat that I had finally kind of found the magic formula that I like to work with. And so there are things like a slide with an image on the right and a slide with an image on the left and different kinds of two column slides. All of that comes from this cascading style sheet called Apron that has these things called slide layouts. And if I click on that, it'll start to look to you a little bit like how you may be familiar with PowerPoint slides, right? You can choose, you can use these, these words up in the class section of any slide. So you can make it a title slide or an image left side, or a two-column slide, or a three-column slide. And it will allow you to do all of those renderings with the apron style sheet. And then there's also the Descartes style sheet that allows you to do things like imaging, uh, like image placement. So I'm going to slide forward here and see if I can find an example. Oh, you can also do, that's kind of cool, if you want to do sheet music. Um, like this, these kinds of very specific image placements and box placements start to become a possibility with even more style sheet work. And then lastly, there's a thing called tachyons, which is really a way to make things like this box that's done with something called tachyons. And you know, we could get into that, but I I, I kind of think that most of you will find that level of detail is not appropriately placed at this level of the introduction. What I would recommend at this point is uh, after, I, after I introduce the next exercise is that if you want to shout out a question, but otherwise let me recommend that you go back to 00 underscore markdown.rmd and see what you can do about turning that into a slide deck where every two second level header is a new slide and just start to play with some of the realities of Sheringham. And while you're doing that, uh, it's going to be open season for any question that you can think of, and I will try my best to answer it. And uh, what I'll do is I'll give you about maybe five, six minutes on that. That's what I'm going to suggest is go into your files menu open up 00R Markdown and turn that into 
an actual Sheringham slide, slide deck. Alternatively, you might have a brief bit of code that you're working on, and you might want to just start on your own slide deck. Um, can I ask a question? Absolutely. Yeah, so I was, um, uh, uh, maybe it's easier for me to share my screen. Sure, let me. Um, so basically I was um, trying to make the slides for the, the, the code chunks. Um, and there, uh, is a, there is a figure on it. And um, the figure, it seems like the figure, the size of the figure is too large to fit in the slide. So I was wondering how do I resize that or how do I make it to, to fit? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, let me just make an example. So if I turn, let me just real quickly, I'm, I'm gonna turn this markdown into a slide deck. And I'm gonna do it by going over here and grabbing this code and putting that in the top. Oh, actually I want all of this code. Copy. And so I'm gonna make this right here. And then I'm also going to grab all of this. And that should be the setup for making a slide deck. So this should be slide one. And then I'm gonna make that slide two and that slide three. But then up here, instead of slide two, I'm going to do an example um, resize image, right? So let's get some code going from your library. All right, so if I save that and knit that. I now have, there's my code, and now we want to deal with the image size. So let me just do this, just to make sure nothing crashes. Move that over to, uh, all right, so the first thing I'm going to do in this case, in my case, is I'm going to change that to show output only. And the image is still probably not the right size. There we go, it's close enough. Now, if I want to change the size of that, I'm going to just click on this gear in the code chunk and change this to use custom figure size. And then I might make it, um, let's say, I'm going to start with 10. It should be, it says it's in inches. 10 and 6, and we'll see how that shows up. And I might also, just because I like to um, change the dev to SVG, because you usually get crisper graphic out of that. Uh, but that did a pretty good job of generating a particular size, right? OK, well, uh, I haven't heard any, but uh, you guys are welcome to unmic at any time. You can see that I, I did, in fact, um, start to turn this into a slide deck, and you saw how I did it. A more traditional way would have been to start, you know, specifically through new file and our markdown. And then in my case, at this point, I would probably start with Sheringham Themer, the ninja themed presentation. But all that does is some of the stuff that I copied and pasted. So I might add author title and date. Uh, let's see, date. Today is April 6, 2021. Or as you may or may not know, you can you can actually do inline R code here. So this date. That should um, bring up some, some more things. And then really the simple, the simple techniques are just to uh, 
are just to put these slide designations at the beginning of everything. This one I might change to class colon middle, uh, just because I I'm not always crazy about it when it's all the way up at the top, but my mind changes on that on a regular basis. And then you saw the resized image one. And I should be able to do a, a, a title here. Wonder if that, and if I did that, I might, ah, yeah, that, that's probably not what I want because it's so small, but there's other, there are other functions in, um, in ggplot to make those fonts larger and smaller. But then you'll no doubt run into, uh, here's an example of where I've got too much stuff and then I might just wanna, I might wanna tweak it uh, so that I have two slides that might be the easiest thing to do. And that's probably, this, in this case, it's gonna be three slides. And that's pretty much that's pretty much the, the bulk of it. Um, it doesn't really get more complicated than that. So uh, I want to I definitely would encourage you to use this. There are other ways to make slides. Just so you know, if I go to a new file, R Markdown, there's an option right here that says presentation, and you can make. I don't use any of these, so I can't really tell you much about it, but you can make IO slides, slidey slides, Beamer slides, or even PowerPoint slides. I'm pretty certain that PowerPoint slides and sharing slides work quite similarly together um, in that you know, you're using R Markdown and probably all of them you're using R Markdown because it comes from this Markdown template um, and you're probably designating the slides differently. But I don't have any um, real, experience with any of the others. Uh, the Sheringen slides work pretty well, in my opinion, you may, have seen, you may see them around. So I thank you for your attention. Uh, you can always get in touch with me uh, through the email at my department, askdata at duke.edu. And if you want to, you can make an appointment with me. Uh, you can just schedule me. And um, I wish you good luck. And I will record this and send you a link when the recording's done. But uh, just let me know if you have any questions. And have a good night. <laughs>